On today's World Inside, uproar over a new U.S. student visa rule with two top universities leading a lawsuit to strike it down. Questions over the academic future of international students in the U.S. This is not about education. This is an attack on students, and it's an attack on universities. And China and the U.S. headed for Smithville? Why divorce is far from a viable option. The hard lessons both learn on the pandemic from an American observer. Hello and welcome to World of the Insight, coming to you from Beijing. I'm Qian Wei. The U.S. has long had an open policy that attracted talents from all over the world. About a million international students are studying in the U.S. right now and nearly four in ten of them from China. But a new visa policy puts them in danger of deportation, no longer allowed to stay in the U.S. if all their classes are moved online. That did not sit well with at least the two top U.S. universities, which asked a court to block the new visa policy. What does it mean for the academic future of international students in the U.S. universities? How's the international community typing about it and taking it. Let's ask our panelists. For more on international students in the U.S., joining us in Beijing, Teng Jimeng, freelance cultural commentator. Also in Beijing, Jesse Yang, founder of Providence Academy, who is a graduate from Cornell University last year. In Cleveland, David Leopold, a partner of the immigration law group with Elmer and the Byrne LLP. He's also past president and past general counsel of the Washington, D.C.-based American Immigration Lawyers Association. In Iowa City, Tim C. Hagel, professor of political science at the University of Iowa. First of all, it's great to see all of you. It's been quite a long time as a result of the pandemic. We will not be able to see each other that often, but finally get reconnected. Thank you for joining our show. I want to ask directly about that question. What does that mean for universities in the United States? Uh, Professor Hegel. That's a very good question, and it's one that universities, and particularly my university, are struggling with at this point. That here at the University of Iowa, we're planning on going online for all our classes after Thanksgiving, so it's the last two weeks of the semester, and that's where some of the foreign students have concerns because they may be forced to leave the United States at that point. But even before then, if all of a sudden there's a spike in the infections and the university has to go online sooner, then that could put uh, many of these students, the foreign students, but even the students that are here in the United States in really a, a difficult situation in terms of their studies and what they're going to be able to do. Mm. And at this point, we just don't know what's going to happen. We don't know. What about for you, Jesse? Even though you graduated from Cornell University, you are running an international organization trying to provide service and support to Chinese students overseas. I'm sure some of them are facing quite difficult situations right now. What are they telling you? Yes, um, absolutely. As we know, the modification of the ICE major affected for those Chinese students and interna international students from those who was uh, only uh, online classes for the next semester. And as we know, there is nearly 8 to 10 percent of U.S. colleges are planning for an online-only course for the next semester. There's a large amount of students are affected by this policy, and it's including Harvard University and also uh, Bowdoin College and also the enormous California state system, which embraces the most number of Chinese students. And students who are already enrolled in these schools are required to transfer out or leave the country. And as we know, it is nearly impossible to transfer to a school with in-person instruction right now because at this <coughs> moment, in mid-July, there is no transfer admission opened for most of the schools. And also, it's so mm -hmm. difficult for Chinese students to leave the country at this moment because they have already made, probably signed a housing contract lease or other uh, monetary arrangements such as uh, car insurance, house insurance, it will cause a lot of monetary troubles for them. 
and also flies to various parts of the world. Right. It's extremely scarce and expensive right now, as we know. It's so difficult for them to get flight ticket. And also mm -hmm. most countries have banned the entry from the U.S. because U.S. has the most number of coronavirus patients right now. It's just so difficult for Chinese international students. Mm. And also for those who stayed in the U.S., uh, if they, they, they stay in the school, they will also face the, the threat of being affected by the virus. So Indeed. I'm thinking that Chinese international students, students are forced to, to choose between, their, between continue their higher education or their own personal health. So it's mm. a dilemma for all of the Chinese international students, I believe. It's a long list of difficulties and challenges you just outlined. And by yes, the way, Chinese exactly. students only occupy about 30% of international students inside the United mm -hmm. States. There are others coming from all over the world that are facing similar situations. We have noticed uh, some of the latest uh, development, uh, Harvard University and some of the other educational institutions uh, are ready to sue the federal government. Cornell University announced on Wednesday that it will join Harvard and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in a lawsuit which asked a federal court in Boston to block a new visa rule on foreign students. The new immigration policy would bar international students from staying in the U.S. if all their classes are moved online this fall. It also marked an unexpected reversal of exceptions when colleges and universities in March rushed to shutter campuses and move to online classes as the pandemic triggered lockdowns. The lawsuit said the Trump administration skirted the proper rulemaking process and asked the court to strike it down. Now the details are still uh, need to be clarified, but your immediate reaction to that? Look, this is an administration that doesn't follow the law. Don't take my word for it. That's what the Supreme Court said in a recent decision on DACA. Uh, the, uh, a case about the young, uh, not, the young undocumented uh, immigrants in this country. The Supreme Court said to the Trump administration, and it's not the first time that courts have said this, look, don't, you don't follow the law. You need to follow the law. And it's the same thing here. This is not, this is, this is a, they're, they're thumbing their nose, the Trump administration is, at the law. Um, and specifically, what law? Well, the rules in place uh, these are rules upon which universities have relied, students have relied. Um, we're in the middle of a pandemic. They are taking action, by the way, which is not founded in regulation. What came out yesterday or the day before was what we call a broadcast memo mm -hmm. from uh, a group called uh, a, a Division of Immigration and Customs Enforcement called the Student Exchange Visitor Program, SEDP. That's not the force of law. That's not statute. That's not a regulation. That's a bureaucrat writing a memo. And so, yes, they will sue and they will um, most likely get a restraining order mm -hmm. uh, on this because it is a violation of the law. Let's be clear about what's really happening here. This is not about education. This is an attack on students and it's an attack on universities. This is a $40 billion uh, charge to the American economy by Xing out foreign students. And what's really going on here is the Trump administration, which has completely botched the response to coronavirus, is trying to force our universities to reopen. They know full well that many universities rely heavily on the funds that they get from foreign students. And so if they put them in this untenable situation of no funding, i.e. no foreign students versus reopening, they're going to try to get them to reopen. The other thing it is, it, the other thing it is, is an attack on foreign students who, by the way, bring culture, uh, bring, bring, bring their skills, mm -hmm. add to our economy, add to the wealth of our universities, ideas, innovation, I could go on and on with, with the amazing things that our foreign students bring. This is a way to cut out legal immigration without changing a word of the law. This is the moniker of the Trump administration. This is what they've been doing since day one. Yeah. And they've been using in a very cynical way the coronavirus pandemic, the tragedy that 
has just been pointed out, we are now the leaders of the world in coronavirus, America is. We've got 130,000 plus tragic deaths to mourn in this country. The other thing it is, it's an insidious attack on the program called Optional Practical Training, OPT. Many of our students that come over here and finish their degree programs spend a year, or if they're STEM students, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, mm. can go on to spend as much as two, two years uh, plus working for employers, American employers, uh, in, their, uh, in, their, in their occupation, in their, in their chosen field. What this does, by putting students, foreign students, overseas, by mandating that they be overseas because they're taking online programs during a pandemic, they, they're going to lose, many of them will, okay. their ability for optional practical training. What the Trump administration is doing is trying to blot out student visas and students coming over here to study and punishing our universities, our great universities in this country, if they don't bend to President Trump's will. Professor Tang from Beijing, I do want to also invite your views too. Uh, because you have many talented students that are studying right now in the United States or on their way, in fact, to study in the U.S. or elsewhere in the world. Some of them return to China, some of them stay there, uh, those who studied already in the U.S. So when you heard as an educator about the latest uh, decision by the U.S. side, what's your reaction? Well, Jianwei, it strikes me as unacceptably uh, abrupt. I mean, this is totally inflexible and completely disregarding of the difficulties created uh, for international students, and especially Chinese students. As you have said, that uh, almost, I mean, 400,000 students, I mean, Chinese students studying in the United States accounting for almost half of the international students. As we say, that there are one million international students mm -hmm. studying in the U.S. And so it caused considerable uh, and additional stress and sadness. It's like taking their education away from them that is promised in the first place. And also the kind of uh, severance from this very nation that many of my students feel so much emotionally, I mean, basically so attached. I mean, the United States has been a country that has been nice to the world. Mm. I myself have been two times Fulbright scholars in the States. It's a very considerate, it has a very considerate institution, very considerate faculty on university campuses. Now this very administration is, is, is cutting off, I mean, basically it's cutting off and, 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 and causing this frustration that leaves students very frustrated, if not angry. I mean, I ask my students in, in USC, in University of um, uh, North Carolina, at mm -hmm. NYU, they were all actually thrown into this very, this very chaos. Right. I mean, in Chinese culture, chaos is such a negative term that one, is, one finds itself uh, trapped in in a situation, for example, like COVID-19. I mean, it adds this very frustration, a new frustration, yes. an additional stress uh, to them right now. <laughs>
Well, it's hard to say what the purpose is, and certainly different people have different views as to what it was. Mr. Leopold expressed some ideas along those lines. Other people have a different view. Obviously, the administration would disagree and so forth. As far as the universities are concerned, or let's say education more generally, here also you have different views on things. As far as uh, grade school and high school uh, things, people want them to open in part because students want to be able to, or students and their parents want them to be able to socialize and get that education that they need to get out of the house and so forth. And of course, then it means that parents can go back to work if, they, if their kids are taken care of. At the university level, at least at my university, we want to open, we want to have the students there. And I would personally like to have face-to-face -face instruction rather than to just go online. And of course, we had in the spring semester great disruption where in the middle of the semester, when the pandemic was, was in its early stages and there was great concern as far as how it was going to unfold, yeah. that we immediately went to online. And that caused, again, a great disruption. A lot of the students didn't like it, didn't do as well. And as far as instructors are concerned, they mm -hmm. were sort of discombobulated as well. So we want to open as well. And there are financial considerations. And Mr. Leopold uh, touched on this a little bit too, not just for the international students, but just generally that we, you know, the universities that part of their uh, uh, funding comes from tuition, not all of it, of course, uh, especially for example, at the University of Iowa or state school. So we get a certain amount of state funding yeah. and grants and things of that nature. So there are many factors that go into this and it's very difficult in terms of dealing with all of these at once. But on the other hand, what are we going to do as far as the pandemic is concerned? Because you've got sort of the, the push pull of what well, we want to open, but we want to be safe at the same time. Yes, exactly. How do we handle those two things? How do we balance those things? Jesse, I do want to ask you about that. Now, there are several options the students now on campus could have. Either they go back to their own country, which there could be difficulties of transportation, uh, or they can also enroll in their universities back at home. I understand there are some kinds of arrangement between American University and Chinese University in an emergency. What should be the way out? Do you know and heard some from of your friends? Example of my uh, mother school, Cornell University. Actually, Cornell University proposed uh, a model of uh, hybrid studies. Uh, it established online study system and also established partnership with many local Chinese universities, such as Tsinghua University, Peking University, and also uh, Shanghai Jiao Tong University, Fudan Universities. So Cornell undergrad students can choose to study in these Chinese universities uh, in person with in-person instruction, and also take some of the online classes meanwhile. So um, it, it fits the, the, the right now's modification, and I think it's a great model for uh, the hybrid study system for Chinese international students. Mm. And also I'm thinking about probably um, based on example of Cornell, many of the universities in America can uh, learn from this model and also they can together uh, design a very special model for international students. Professor Tung, finally before we go, I know you and many other professors from Chinese universities are also trying to offer the best for students, not only here in this country, but international students coming to study in China. Tell me about uh, some of the immediate plans you are trying to come up with in order to deal with this emergency. Well, right now, we're actually I've been receiving uh, kind of invitations to teach and teach online and also in-person classes on campuses in Beijing. Uh, we have American colleagues actually telling us that uh, there were almost 300 Chinese students who are supposedly studying in the fall semester in the U.S. now actually are stranded because of this policy. Uh, in Beijing, in China in general. And so we have to put together a class, uh, a kind of an impersonal class. And once again, there's also lots of uncertainties because uh, in September, maybe we, can't, we, we here in China may not be able to teach this impersonal class. But one thing for sure is that we, we will organize this kind of a class 
uh, for these students now uh, kind of a, um, uh, being left behind in China. And so a class will be offered and a class will be taught to them and uh, various courses now are being available. Mm -hmm. I'm actually collecting syllabi for uh, students and different courses and put together a team of professors now in various universities here in Beijing so that we can offer this very uh, these various courses here in Beijing in the fall. Right. Turbulent time, gentlemen. Of course, you've been all trying your best to try to help with those in need. Thank you so much for your service and also be well. Tang Ji Meng, Jesse Yang, David Leopold, and Timothy Hagel. Thank you. Really appreciate it. You're watching World Insights. Still to come on our program today. China and the U.S. Headed for a splitsville, why divorce is far from a viable option, and the hard lessons both learned on the pandemic from an American observer. Welcome back. You're still watching World Insight with me, Tian Wei. The world's top two economies, China and the U.S., have been each other's largest trading partner for years. But China lost its spot as the biggest exporter of goods to the U.S. last year, a result of President Trump's trade war. Geopolitical tensions flare up again amid the COVID-19 pandemic. More uncertainty with the U.S. headed for November elections. What are the dangers of the ties between the two reaching a historic low? Earlier, I talked to Thomas Friedman, a columnist from the New York Times. He recently wrote an article arguing that for the past 40 years, the two countries had an unconscious economic coupling. But now, China and America are heading toward apparently divorce. Is it true? Take a listen. You've been arguing there's a divorce, quote unquote. <laughs> Uh, between China and the United States. Uh, you always use a uh, funny language and also attractive way to attract people's attention. But, you know, Mr. Freeman, tell me more about exactly which stage you think China and U.S. is their relationship. Well, we're meeting with our lawyers right now. <laughs> Who <Both laughs> are our lawyers, Mr. Freeman? I'm our looking forward to meeting them, too. Our divorce lawyers. <laughs> the U.S. and China, um, if the world is going to thrive, in the 21st century, it can only thrive with a, 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 a certainly a minimum and hopefully a maximum of U.S.-China collaboration. I believe that the economic ties and the diplomatic collaboration uh, between the U.S. and China between 1979 and 2019, that four-decade period, um, produced so much of the prosperity, was an engine for so much prosperity and for so much global stability for the last four decades. And if we, if we fracture that, uh, we, will, we will be a less prosperous world and we'll be a less stable and secure world. So both sides have grievances with the other. Um, the, what is missing right now is, is the kind of minimal level of trust and dialogue. Find areas where we can cooperate to limit the fallout of, uh, of, of the disagreements I, in my time following U.S.-China relations, which is, uh, you know, for several decades, I don't remember a time when there was less trust in the relationship. The majority, I believe, the majority in both countries, though, really benefited from, enjoyed, and want to see continue the kind of economic collaboration, uh, the kind of tourism, the kind of student travel, the kind of diplomatic engagement around big issues called climate change. That's where the majority is, I believe, in China and in America. But right now, it's actually not the majorities that are driving the relationship. Mm -hmm. But then the question naturally is, how can we avoid let the minority kidnap the overall nature of this relationship? Well, you know, it, it's going to, I believe, I don't know what is a sufficient way, but I know what is necessary uh, from the American side. Okay. And, um, uh, I won't speak to the Chinese side. Um, you know better, but uh, I, on the American side, we need a different president. 
um, with a different uh, national security team that acts on what has been the traditional American approach with China, which is build bridges where possible, mm -hmm. cooperate wherever we can, and draw red lines where we disagree. Um, and there's still a huge necessity for us uh, to work together. But at the same time, I will tell you, there is a level of mistrust in the relationship. Yeah. Um, as a journalist, I'll tell you, the New York Times has basically been virtually thrown out of China, except one reporter, same with the Washington Post and the I Wall would Street say Journal. same thing about uh, CCTV and CGTN now being listed as so-called a foreign entity uh, rather than media oh, organizations. Well, obviously, two sides have different views. Go ahead. Um, our countries are too big and too important to the whole fate of the world uh, for us to have any other strategy. So we can't actually get divorced. You know why? Because we're actually Siamese twins. We are actually <laughs> Okay. And um, what you have when two Siamese twins try to get a divorce, that's kind of what's going on right now. Yeah. I was trying to read uh, some of your columns earlier about China-U.S. relations. I was also looking at some of the articles by some thinkers like Mr. Fukuyama with his recent piece on China-U.S. relations. Uh, we see actually some strong voices also from where you are talking about there is not enough reasons for a quote-unquote natural decoupling between the two countries, China and the United States, just as you argued earlier. So uh, right now, our rhetorics, and particularly rhetorics invented by a few, driving us apart, are the picture really that bad as being portrayed in the media? Now, no offense to our trade, right? We are all in the media, but you know, to, to talk about it as a whole, uh, Mr. Freeman, your thought, are we being told that we are so much apart, or, or actually we are really apart? Very good question. It's a very good question, and I would say it, the answer is yes and no. There's still a huge amount of trade um, between us, even in the middle of a pandemic, um, and there's still a huge necessity for us uh, to work together. But at the same time, well, I will tell you, there is a level of mistrust in the relationship. Yeah. It's almost like we need to go to a marriage council. We need a weekend retreat together. Yes. Um, and out of the public view, sit down. We hear your grievances. We hear your bottom lines. You hear our grievances, our bottom lines. Not just a one hour, two hour meeting between world leaders. I mean, I'm talking about a deep dive where, you know, the where China's secretary of state and national security team and economic team and Americas literally go off to Hainan Island or Hawaii or wherever and spend a week together really just saying what is bothering you and let me see if what's bothering you I can fix and maybe you can see if what's bothering me you can fix but right now we're just um, you know it, the, the, the relationship is just full of angst and anxiety and mistrust and it's really not healthy and it's not the world will be a less prosperous and a less stable place if we can't get over this home. Before coming here, I was trying to look at the history a little bit just to match your level of intelligence. Uh, I was listening to a speech given by Ronald Reagan when he was first visiting China back in the 1970s, and he was talking about you know, uh, to, to an audience in Fudan University in Shanghai, and he said, the first thing he said is a Chinese student studying in the United States that his team talked to before their trip to China. My staff spoke to him before he left. Mr. Ye wants you to know he's doing fine. He's working hard on his spring term papers, and his thoughts turn to you often. He asked me to deliver a message to his former students, colleagues, friends, and family. He asked me to say for him, and I hope I can, Wo Xiang Yan Da Jia. I mean, at that point, it was a difficult time. It was a time, even though their political will, but there have been decades of separation between China and the United States, and with leaders coming out and trying to set an example. So, Tom, I really want to ask you, don't all of us, have a responsibility like that to set an example. If some of the politicians don't do that, can we do that? Well, that's why I want to be on your show. You know, I mean, I really uh, appreciate that. Uh, I want I want people in 
uh, China to know, though, that people like myself who believe in the engagement strategy, which is build bridges where possible, draw red lines where necessary, we are going to disagree and compete on important things, you know, um, whether it's human rights or business or politics. But um, uh, people like me and my holding my views are, are, are um, you know, not um, uh, in the ascendant right now. Um, and I could list my grievances, I did in my column, um, uh, and you could list the grievances from China. Neither of us can really do much about it. Um, but I think the important thing, and my hope, is that when we get a new administration in Washington, um, that we can do uh, not just a meeting. This, this relationship, it needs a complete overhaul for the 21st century. Yes. We're still operating on some of the principles and ideas. Going back to the Shanghai communique, it's a very different relationship. Ch China is not just selling us toys, T-shirts, and tennis shoes. It wants to sell us deep, high-tech items that are all dual-use technologies. America, the same. So we, we, we have many deep things to discuss if we're going to propel this relationship in a productive and peaceful way into the 21st century. And we need to, but, but we're, we're operating on just the fumes, the, the momentum, basically, of the last 40 years, and it needs a complete reboot. And that you can't do in one summit with a three-hour scripted meeting between the leaders. We've been reading your columns and articles over the past few months. Since the start of the pandemic until now, what do you think are some of the biggest lessons we as a whole, human beings, should learn this time? You know, Wei, I think the most important lesson is that um, we are all, for the first time, in the grip of Mother Nature. And um, unless you were alive um, in 1918, uh, when the last major global pandemic was, um, you haven't experienced this. And what does it mean to be in the grip of Mother Nature? What it means is that Mother Nature throws these things at us, these challenges. They're called viruses, they're called droughts, they're called floods, they're called wildfires. They're all the challenges she throws at us to see who will be the fittest, who, which plant or animal or human will get their DNA into the next generation. And what Mother Nature demands when she's throwing these challenges at us, she does not reward the strongest. She does not reward the smartest. She actually only rewards the most adaptive. Mm. Who's the most adaptive to my challenge? And she rewards three adaptation strategies in particular. She asks every country three questions. Mm -hmm. First, do you respect my virus? Because if you don't respect her power, the power of her virus, she will hurt you or someone you love. Second, she asks, are you coordinated in your adaptation strategy? Because I, Mother Nature, have evolved my virus over millennia to find any crack in your immune system, yeah. your individual immune system or your communal immune system. And lastly, lastly, she asks, is your adaptation strategy built on chemistry, biology, and physics, or is it built on politics, ideology, and an election schedule? Because if it's not built on chemistry, biology, and physics, because that's all I am, Mother Nature. I'm just chemistry, biology, and physics. And if your adaptation isn't built on that, right. then I will hurt you mm -hmm. someone you love. Tom, you know, the World Health Organization had been warning that the worst are yet to come. And we also heard from uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci from the U.S. talking about possibly if things are go really wrong, 100,000 new cases every day. Well, that is a dare situation. But, you know, as a whole, collectively, the world, where is our mark from 1 to 10? How much do you think we should get right now? You know, what you really see um, is that it's impossible to give the world a grade because you see basically three different adaptation strategies. Um, one is the adaptation strategy adopted by China using the, all the powers of its state mm. um, to test, track, trace, and quarantine people. Uh, then you see different versions of that in Germany, in South Korea, in Singapore, New Zealand, etc. Yeah. That strategy is basically lockdown, test, track, and trace. 
and wait for a vaccine, we'll control the spread of the disease until we get a vaccine to get herd immunity. Second strategy is Sweden, which is actually uh, to stay partially open, expose their people to the virus, and get natural herd immunity. Hasn't worked entirely perfectly, but I wouldn't judge the Sweden case um, yet. The last, the third major strategy is the American strategy, which is we talk like we're doing the China approach. We actually act like we're going for Sweden's herd immunity. We're actually preparing for neither, and we're claiming to be superior to both. So our strategy is a complete mess of 50 states, some doing it well, I would say, locking down and then testing, tracking, tracing, and quarantining, and wearing masks and social distancing, mm. and some doing it incredibly poorly. It's very frightening to be here now because you see you know, this exponential curve now with a pandemic, it can get completely out of control. You didn't answer my question directly, but I can figure out exactly what your answer is. Um, however, at a time of crisis, throughout history, as you may know very well, it brings the best and it also brings the worst among the human being out. What have you seen over the past half year? Should we be proud of our best? Are we really ashamed and realize it and likely to correct the worst of us? Historically, way, um, America, in the face of any kind of global challenge, America tended to play three roles. We were the um, uh, coordinator, kind of the lead global coordinator of the response. We gave aid um, to those most harmed. And we were a source of scientific knowledge of what is the best approach. And um, America has not played that role in this pandemic under the Trump administration. So there has not been a coordinated response. And um, because of that, our global response is very suboptimal. Hmm. Tom, you may know the vaccine certainly should be on the mind of everybody because the science really could help us and probably that's the only thing that could really help us. Uh, however, many experts I've been talking to, I'm sure you have been interacting with as well, have been warning us of inflated hope upon vaccines because time is needed. Meanwhile, uh, exact vaccine for the coronavirus, uh, even after the mutation, could be very challenging. So. This is a new normal likely we are going to face. To you, what is the new normal? You've been writing columns about that, but what is your latest understanding of this new normal now? Well, you know, again, I can only speak about America. Um, and, uh, you know, there are two kind of cultures in the world, just very generally speaking. There are tight cultures and loose cultures. Cultures that tend to be top down, respectful of rules and authority, um, uh, and very order bound. Um, I'm talking about China, Korea, Germany, um, uh, Japan. And then there are loose cultures, uh, America, Italy, Spain, the Mediterranean, cultures that don't really follow orders very well, um, are not very authority bound, etc. Well, the, in responding to a pandemic, uh, tight cultures do a lot better than loose cultures. Uh, culturally, Americans can't um, seem to do this, and they're and they're we're really failing at the at the basic challenge. And what what is so disturbing to me, and again I, I'm caught up with my own country right now, is that Donald Trump will not be judged uh, as president for what he didn't do or did do early on. Early on, when whatever you did was hard, it was uncertain um, and widely debated. What he is being judged harshly for is what he's doing now in June. In June, when, when the right response is clear, scientifically proven, and easy. Just have every person wear a mask anywhere in public. Socially distance, trace, track, and test, and protect the most vulnerable. We know exactly what to do. And what's so frightening from an American's point of view, and to any friend of America out in the world, is we, we can't agree on doing this easy stuff. But Tom, is it just the president's problem? I mean, particularly this president's problem. Within the system, for example, uh, can Congress act? Can they enforce also with their own power, utmost power, 
uh, in the states, uh, different states, there are those who are doing much better job than the others. So obviously you see across the board, you know, there are those who should be responsible that have been not, and there are those who are responsible and have been exactly doing it, isn't it? Yes, but the problem is that, is that yes, we have a federal system, and states and localities, mayors, have a great deal of autonomy, okay? And that's good when you're dealing with economics, uh, maybe politics, mm -hmm. but when you're dealing with a virus that spreads silently, mercilessly, and exponentially, and does not know where the border between Florida and Georgia is, or Oklahoma and Texas, having a 50-state strategy really doesn't work. And you see it coming apart right now because these massive accelerations of the spread of the virus in the South, and people fly from the South to the North, or they drive to meet their families, exactly. uh, it won't pay in the South. So when you're up against a virus like this, you need, as I said in the beginning, you need to be coordinated, and we're not. And I want to thank you for joining us on this discussion, Tom. I know you have a very long day, and also your columns have been very brave in expressing your views, which echoes worldwide. Thank you so much. Thomas Friedman, columnist from the New York Times. Really appreciate it, Tom. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thomas Friedman. And that's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, you can search World Inside. That's our program. And also check out our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Tian Wei on behalf of the team. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.